This conference will now be recorded. These are uh, mixed like the medical eligibility criteria. That's very important. You have to stick to them. Okay. One method cannot be good for all patients, though most of the methods they are safe. And uh, if they ask you to comment, then why do people use contraception? Because they want to improve maternal health between the uh, two pregnancies. WHO says that if the birth is spaced by like two years, then in that time, first of all, mother will recover completely. Secondly, she will be able to breastfeed the baby for like two years, two and a half years, like a, as a community as as far as many as long as she can do that. Then, if the mother has some pre-existing condition in which if she will become pregnant, it will increase her morbidity and even mortality. So, like mortality, like I will tell you in cases of pulmonary hypertension, then uh, cardiomyopathy, it can be there. So many things can be there. They can go wrong. Okay. And then if we give a wrong contraception, form of contraception to anyone, again, we are going to increase mortality for them. So when we talk about the methods, variety of methods can be used. Like from simple vitreous interrupters, but the, like when they are, the man is about to ejaculate, then he can withdraw and they can hold this ejaculation. But this method is associated with like 50% failure rate, so it is not done. Okay. So if the people they are sure that they can use it, it's up to them. Then post-coital douche, like a long time back, like 50 years ago, maybe 60 years ago, what they used to that, uh, do was that they will take this common household vinegar or plain water, mix them, and then a variety of other substances, we know nothing about them. So they used to do these douches. So like they will enjoy, put this water with a small pipe, you will hold this can of water a bit higher than the person, and then they will clean basically the vagina. But you can understand that it was also associated with a high failure rate, and uh, that is one thing. Then another method, lactational aminoria method. This method in the first six months of pregnancy, well, six months of postpartum period is highly effective, as effective as 98%, but everyone is different. So patient can have sporadic ovulation and then patient can become pregnant. The criteria is that if the patient is exclusively feeding the baby, baby is not taking even water. Actually, babies should not take water from outside till the age of six months and no fee of weaning. The only uh, food for the baby is mother's milk. Okay, so if she is exclusively feeding the baby day and night, then this method is 98% successful. But the efficacy it will drop and the failure rate will increase. The failure rate can be 8% at one year like that. That is one thing. So the baby is suckling, so she has like hyperprolactinemia, so it is going to decrease the level of GnRH, and that's why your patient will have like. Um, patient will be a minority and ovulatory, so she will not conceive. But it is said that don't have to rely on this method unnecessarily. So complete three months of feeding and then mother should better go for a reliable form of contraception. Then the barrier methods, contraceptive sheets such as condoms uh, or like uh, female condoms, they can be used. So basically, People used to think that it is going to protect them against most of the STIs, but we know that the viral infections, they can still be transmitted, like HIV virus, it can go. Many viruses, they can cross the plastic sheath, but still it is going to give some protection from the um, STIs. And why? Because, you know, the bacteria, they will not pass through it. And if one person is having infection, then less chance of infection in the second person. So the, then female sheaths. They can also be used and they are made of like very thin polyurethane material and it has two flexible rings at both ends. One ring will fit into the depth of the vagina and the other ring, it will be outside the vagina near the introitus. So female condoms, they have the advantage of being under the control of the female partner and offering some protection against STIs. But this is associated with very high failure rate and that is like the failure rate can be like 18% easily. And the uh, risk of acquiring HIV infection is more than 
then they can use you know female condoms they are different and the female sheets they are also different the female diaphragms not sheet diaphragms are also they are like a cap so what they do they range in size from 50 to 105 millimeters and uh, they have been designed to fit in the vagina in which part in the posterior part of douglas and it is going to cover the cervix also so the designs can be variable but this is the philosophy so but this one is also associated with very high failure rate like that like when they are using it typically then it typically means that they are trying to use it most of the time the so failure rate at one year is going to be 15 to 20 percent actually the failure rates they are not given in percent they are given as 15 to 20 pregnancies per 100 women years uh, this years how they measure like you have 10 persons they have used one form of contraception for five years so basically you have 50 years because each person has been using it for five years and there were 10 persons so 10 into 5 you are getting 50. so 10 persons they have been using contraception for 10 years so that is going to be 100 years of use so don't get upset this is just a way of describing that the failure rate is 15 to 20 pregnancies per 100 years then they can use cervical cap but the problem with the cervical cap is that these are tiny caps patients sometimes cannot exactly locate that where it is and then sometimes they will remove very early after the coitus so again the chance of failure is very high so the directions are if someone is using cervical cap that they should leave the cap in place for 8 to 14 48 hours after the intercourse and then they should remove it the problem with this approach is that a patient can forget it inside and then what will happen then she is going to have this infection like that or foreign body reaction can be there then people use many different types of swelling serial preparations which contain non oxinol 9 which is a long acting surfactant and uh, that is toxic to the spermatozoa so these are basically spermicides they're going to kill the sperm in the female genital tract just remember they have um, non oxinol 9 that is the name of it then they can practice periodic abstinence like they are calling it calendar method that they are just taking that thinking that what is the average duration of a female cycle and then they're calculating like if she's having menstruation every 28 days then they're going to locate the day 14 and then they will tell the people that they can have quarters in the first week first week after uh, menses and then from the middle like day 14 to 17 they should avoid like so day 7 to day um, 17 they should avoid and then or they should use another method and then after that day 17 they can resume the normal activity but the failure rate is very high like 35 degree 35 uh, percent in one year use so that is not reliable now we don't another method is um, basal body temperature since when this ovulation takes place at that time the progesterone level is very high and progesterone is thermogenic it produces heat so there was used to say that if the temperature of the woman rises like 5.7 degree fahrenheit or 0.3 to 0.4 degree centigrade it means that ovulation is taking place it will rise suddenly so what they do to uh, used to do that uh, once the temperature will return to normal so better at that time they will have sex because by that time the ovum must must have passed on or undergone this autolysis that was the point but that is also associated with very high failure rate then people have been using this cervical mucus method like they used to take the um, you know cervical secretions and spread it with the fingers if it would be like stretchy elastic then they will say okay there is a lot of estrogen so this is the mid cycle because ovulation has taken place and when these secretions they will become like um, thick then they will say that okay now we should avoid it but the problem with all of these methods was that they were not reliable at all so then world started using this cocps and they have been used since 1960 like 60 years ago before that there was no concept of using any cocps so cocps they have like many benefits these benefits are gynecological and then non-gynecological like we can treat acne 
and then in the gynecological thing we can treat heavy menstrual bleeding if the patient has irregular cycles then again she can use them and then i am going to decrease the loss of excessive losses every month and uh, when we give cocps to anyone mostly it will have non ethyna nodule because uh, you know many different types of pills they have been used they will have like estradiol and um, then they will have any different type of progesterone so initial progesterones they were associated with high level of these progesterones which were associated which have had good androgenic potential even now we, when we are using these progesterone like in the jasmine pill they have a higher potential for complications can cause vte and then they can also cause um, excessive hirsutism when they ask you in the exam you should be able to mention like two three main effects benefits and the side effects so that they will know that you know about all of these things but with correct use these pills are very effective and with the typical use the failure rate is like 18% like my, and the most common cause of this pill will be that patient forgot to take the medicine on time or they didn't take it at all like that that is one thing then we should remember when you will talk about cocps you should say that it gives protection against ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer also more protection from ovarian cancer like 40 to 80% and 50% in cases of endometrial cancer with one year of use like that and this effect it stays there for like 5 years after stopping the pills so this is a great advantage but they also increase the risk of having cervical cancer like that then 30 to 50% of the patients who are taking cocps they can have benign fibrocystic disease of the breast like that so like the breast they will have become like nodular there will be mastalgia as it occurs because the pills are going to mimic the activity of the pregnancy hormones giving false message to the ovaries that this woman is pregnant like that then regarding the uh, side effects venous thromboembolism especially in the patients who are having some familiar risk factors or sedentary way of life they are smokers and they are obese like that and uh, the, the chance of having vte 5 in 100000 and the chance of having vte during pregnancy that is 12 in 1000 and similarly if a patient has been taking when she became pregnant and she has been taking the pills then again her risk of developing vte will increase to 30 in 1000 so you have to choose the drugs very carefully so then you should know that pills they will come in different preparations basically they have ethanol estradiol most of the drugs they have ethanol uh, estradiol and some of the drugs they have mestranol like norinil it can have then you know this zoli the newer pills that is we are using fourth generation pill z-o-e-l-y zoli contains estradiol and that is 17 beta estradiol because ethanol estradiol or e estradiol that is contained in more than 95 percent of the pills so the zoli it contains 17 beta estradiol and its progesterone is also different that is nomigestral acetate just remember nomigestral acetate and then these zoli pills we are using them for 24 days and the pill free interval is going to be four days 24 days you are taking the drug and the drug free interval is four days like that so most of the drugs they are like combination tablets and then some of them they will be biphasic biphasic means like they are containing different doses like in the first part they can have more dose of this ethanol estradiol and less dose of progesterone and then in the later half of the cycle like from day 11 to 21 the dose of the estrogen will be the same but dose of the dose of the progesterone it will increase so these are biphasic okay then triphasic where the concentration of the drugs will change three times so by like i will give you example like you have any 
combination filled with five physic activity so what will happen progesterone level that is uh, that is going to change like in the start of the cycle half dose middle of the cycle full dose then in the not half the first week let's say in the first week it is one in week two it will become two in week three it will become again one so these are triphasics so that is only if they ask you then there can be multiphasic multiphasic means now the dose of the progesterone can be continuous the same dose all the time and dose of the estrogen that can be changed like in the initial week let's say it is 0 0.02 in the second week it is 0 0.03 and then in the week four week three it is going to be 0 0.035 so just changing by fraction because these are hormones so changing even a little amount is going to make so much difference zoily i told you that the new fourth generation pill and that is used for a shorter period 24 days the patient will take the pill rather than taking for 28 21 days patient will take and then patient will take longer like 24 days and then just four days will be pill free another fourth generation pill is culera culera contains estradiol valerate and denogest a different type of progesterone and that is also multiphasic zoli that is just simple phase like that then the progesterone only pills progesterone only pills we call them uh, mini pill also and in like 99 percent of your patients and uh, these pills are safe these are also like first generation second generation and depending upon the type of the progesterone so some of these pills they will be effective only for a short period of time so the problem is that they have short period short window so patient has to take one pill every day at after 24 hours and if she forgets to take one pill then she will have to take next pill within 27 hours like today she has taken the pill at 7 pm tomorrow she forgot let's say tomorrow she will forget to take then she, suddenly she remembers that she had to take the pill at 7 pm then she will go and uh, she remembered at 10 pm so still she is safe why because between 7 and 10 three hours so total window of time is going to be 27 hours if she's taking serazate serazate also has disogestrel then this window it will extend by 12 hours so if she's taking one pill today and she it takes the next pill after 36 hours still she is going to be fine that is the thing and in most of the conditions the progesterone only pills are going to be fine so then if they forget it like for two days then she will have to take uh, if she remembers after 36 hours then she will have to take two pills then the other use of the progesterone pills is that when you have to offer emergency contraception here you can give two doses of lemon or gestural, like we can give 1.5 mg, uh, um, 1.5 mg this lemon or gestural. Under certain conditions, you are supposed to give higher dose of progesterone. That is, if your patient is like uh, epileptic or she was using some antibiotics, then for the duration of them, for emergency contraception, this patient will take three milligrams. If she's epileptic or she's taking any other type of enzyme inducers because now the metabolic rate of these pills it will increase that is one thing then the other form of emergency contraception you know we are giving ulipristal acetate or we can give iucd we will talk about them in a bit so the most significant contraindication for using progesterone will be if your patient has undiagnosed uterine bleeding unless you're sure about the cause don't give it to her second condition will be if your patient has a history of breast cancer then you should not give it because you can give other forms of contraception these are the simple things about the um, you know cocps and pups if they ask you that the patient was taking combined pill and now she has decided to use progesterone only pill what time she can start taking this progesterone so your answer is that she can do that anytime. Why anytime? Because it is not time barred. If it is reasonably clear that this patient is not pregnant, like uh, she's 
is switching immediately after her periods or she is using like in the first week and or she didn't have this coitus so you are sure that she is not pregnant otherwise you can do this pregnant urine test and then you can switch similarly regarding the progesterone she can have tabs she can have injections she can use implants as such there are no contraindications even if she wants to have this injection uh, you just have to see that this patient doesn't have any bleeding disorder and if she has bleeding disorder then you know that cyana it is coming by that name that is also dapometroxy progesterone acetate and it can be given into the subcutaneous tissue into the abdomen and it is going to be equally effective and uh, very easy patient can use that herself also so that is very simple reliable and 50% of the patients we are going to be amenorrheic after one year that is the thing failure rate with perfect use the failure rate is very low like they say that what can be the failure rate that they said like minimal like maybe like seven seven percent even that is considered broke like that then they can ask you that if the patient is taking dapometroxy progesterone acetate so it is known to cause a decrease in the bone density what will happen so the bone loss rate is just 1.5 to 2.5 percent otherwise also if a person is alive and well up to 2% of the bone mass we are losing every year that's why you need to take calcium and you need to sit in the sunlight uh, sunlight or you should take this vitamin d you know that there is deficiency of this vitamin d throughout the world that is how you can prevent the side effects 50% patients they will have no ovulation and uh, 40% they will continue to ovulate especially the younger women you are going to give every 12 weeks but can be given up to 14 weeks no problem there are other preparations but they are not used very frequently like you can give etonorgestrel injection every 8 weeks but most of the people they don't like to use it why because uh, they will not even realize and 8 weeks would have passed so it it can result in contraceptive failure if they ask you about the epileptic patient that can she take injections yes she can take but she should repeat the injections ideally every 10 weeks for dmpa and every 6 weeks for the etonorgestrel even if she is late by like 2 uh, weeks that's fine but if if she comes after 3 weeks or 4 weeks then you have to tell her that uh, she may be you know this emergency contraception is indicated because she has uh, just metab uh, you know wasted this time there was a delay so this efficacy is lost so she needs to have a, another method regarding the implants you can see that these are like simple implants single rod mostly plastic and sometimes they can be some metal can also be on that so under local anesthesia it is inserted and it is highly effective the size can be like maximum 4 cm and this is 2 mm in the diameter so these are very small so they can be used very easily and the problem with them is that they can cause menstrual abnormalities and weight gain then if the patient doesn't want to take the pills then both for estrogen combined pills like which contain estrogen and progesterone and then the progesterone only they can use vaginal rings where which are like 5 cm in diameter and they are 4 mm thick and the rings are flexible and the ring is used worn Uh, the patient is wearing it for three weeks per month, and then we are removing it. And if it is left in place, she forgets for like 14 days, then it is its efficacy is lost like that. So then, if she doesn't like it and she wants to remove it, then she can remove it or she can go for another method of contraception. So the rings, pills, and the transdermal patches of these preparations, these are going to be the same. Their efficacy is comparable, and they are really good. And with perfect use, the failure rate is very low. But the problem with the patch is that if this is detached, then your patient can become pregnant. So we have to see that in which week of the cycle she has this detached patch. And if this patch was detached, like for 
24 hours, then we have to tell her that she should, uh, depends that in which week it has occurred, and then emergency contraception may be indicated. So basically this patch is like total area is 20 centi square centimeter, and it has small adhesive bag. So then we are just posting it on the back, upper shoulder, arm, wherever the patient feels comfortable. So it has like three, year, three layers, and it also contains norgestimate and ethanol estradiol, and it is going dispensing little amount of these hormones into the circulation. And after seven days, we will remove it, and then we are going to place another patch. After that, another patch. And in the fourth week, she will remove them so that she will get this with non bleed like that. If the patient forgot or this to change the patch or it was left there for longer periods of time, then if you know the contraceptive efficacy has been lost. If it was removed and occurred for like less than 24 hours, then she can continue using it in the same way. Like when she has to change the patch, she should pair in this patch, she can use that. But if the patch has been detached for more than 24 hours, then she should, from that day, she should not wait for seven days to complete. She should just replace it. That is one thing. So if your patient had miscarriage, so what she should do? So after miscarriage, she can simply get this one any form of contraception it is not going to increase the risk that is one thing okay but after birth if she is planning to feed the baby uh, she should not use cocps in the first six months and after six months she can start and it is going to be fine and but if she wants to start the progesterone only pills even then she should not start before three weeks three weeks postpartum she can start regarding the intrauterine devices uh, like if your patient has the, the IUDs, they are widely available and they can have like copper, which is mounted on the, this is mounted on the metal. And there is copper and then the second one, Mirena, it can have level or gestural releasing device. That is the one. Level cert is also used and that is also very safe. So the only contraindication for the copper tea is that patient doesn't have allergy to the copper. And for the level of gestural, you have to see that patient is not allergic to titan, titanium or nickel. That is the point. If they're not allergic, we can also, we can insert them. Can be inserted without any analgesic cover. Just counsel the patient and then introduce it. You should know that when you are, that when you can insert, you can insert it immediately after the periods. If you are planning to insert it after birth, then it should be done at the time of the cesarean section or after, after, immediately after removal of the placenta or after birth when the placenta has come out, then you can start. Otherwise, within if you are inserting within 48 hours, that is good. But uh, if you are not inserting in the 48 hours, then you have to wait for four weeks before inserting it. Then you should know about the method that you will take this um, they are giving you a, something like a rod and you are measuring the length of the cavity and then you are adjusting the device in the, plunger, we call it plunger, in the plunger. So there you are fixing it and then we are introducing it like that. And uh, remember that copper IUCD, it can be used for like, uh, now they have licensed it for 10 years and the level not just full, that is used for five years. Then for the male contraception, they can ask you. So right now they can use, um, you know, these barrier methods. They have made some pills, but we don't have enough data. So no one is prescribing that. That is only in the trials. Then they can also have like coitus interrupters or they can use the barrier methods or they can go for vasectomy. Special concerns can be for the women who are at extremes of age, like younger than 16, they can use the large methods, they can use the COCTs without any risk. They can use the progesterone only pills. Second group is the women who are more than 40 years old. So regarding the progesterone only pills, they can use easily till the age of 55. That is the one, okay? And if they have like, um, they want to use COCTs, so usually we are not giving them at the, in this age group or they can take the injection, they can have this with Mirena, they can have this IUCD, so they can use any of these varieties like that. 
somebody is asking for emergency contraception we have to take a detailed history when we will go do any station on that then i will explain to you so that is about contraception yeah i mean you don't have to remember a lot of things just the simple methods simple methods how we are doing that how we are caring for our patient and that's all you need to do then they can ask you about um they can ask you about stis how they are transmitted how you can protect your patients and if it has occurred how you will and you know manage that then they can ask you about the rapes and the problems that what happens how can your patient behave how you will guess that she's having any problem and how you are going to help her so many things can be there then you must have seen in the recalls many times they are asking you about the intimate partner violence because these things are on a rise so expect to have a station like that then they can ask you about you know we covered this menopause in the first in the session on the general gynecology but here also they can bring some station like that that what happens in the menopause what problems she can have they can ask you about osteoporosis stis pid anything they can ask you so these are the simple stations which they expect you to tell them so how you are going to approach the cases just like you do in your real practice, you will go, you will say that we will have an introduction. So you can say that because, you know, I know that there were a problem that they are always rushing the doctors because they are also stressed, stressed out and it is like additional work for them. So they are getting paid for it. But sometimes, you know, people, they can behave in weird ways. So don't think that they are, um, you know criticizing you they are shunning you this is not the case okay? they are just doing their job and that is the problem okay so don't be upset about anything just do the needful don't let anybody make you upset or ang angry simply just do your job read the scenario very carefully go inside and then uh, role player is not there and luckily there will be two examiners not one, one examiner so both are not going to react in the same way that is the thing so answer their questions and if you're not sure that what exactly they have asked you then you will say that i'm not sure can you please repeat the question and then you can continue with that so don't worry about it okay this is going to be a simple thing just you have to focus I know that this is, people find it more stressful because uh, you know you will be sitting and two seniors, two consultants are sitting there and they are asking you. But don't worry, if you are giving, you're telling them even 50, 60 percent, you are going to be fine. So again, regarding the contraception, they can ask you about um, advantages and disadvantages of different forms of contraception. They can also ask you about the barrier methods. They can ask you about steroid contraception. Steroid contraceptions like the COCPs and the POPs, intrauterine contraception, other methods, emergency contraception, and even sterilization. So you should be ready to do all different types of questions. Okay, so you know you are going to be fine. Contraception you have been giving for the patients, you are going to be fine. Don't worry about it. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So how will you take a proper history? Okay. I will introduce myself to the patient. After that, I will take the patient uh, proper age, confirm her age, confirm her name, and then I will uh, ask her about her marital status, whether she's married or single, and then I will ask about um, uh, her uh, LMB, if it is regular, uh, if her period is regular or irregular, if she had one uh, single partner or um, she have multiple uh, partners, um, and since when she's sexually active, if uh, then uh, I will ask about uh, her uh, history. Since when the specific history about since when she started to have the inter intermenstrual uh, uh, bleeding? Um, uh, since how long? And uh, how uh, is it only spotting or it's uh, active bleeding with the clothes? Uh, how many times she changing her bed? Is this associated with dyspironia or just? Um, 
minoria uh, did she have uh, uh, use any uh, uh, should she did she seek any medical advice uh, did that associated with any vaginal abnormal discharge is there is any uh, other sign and symptoms associated with um, with her uh, intermenstrual bleeding uh, is it um, uh, occur at any time or with a specific uh, activity uh, then I will go to her obstetric uh, history uh, her gravid her parity and her previous uh, mood of deliveries if she had used any contraceptive uh, and if there is any complication in her previous uh, pregnancy if any uh, uh, if there is any uh, uh, operation of delivery, uh, third or fourth degree tears. Yeah. Sorry, just my daughter came in. Sorry. No problem. No problem. It's okay. Um, and um, regarding. Um, um, her gynae history, uh, um, uh, her uh, how many multiple parts, how many partners, uh, um, uh, and uh, is it her first marriage or second marriage? Um, is, she, is she taking any contraceptive? The, her last uh, pap smear. Uh, did she have any? Uh, 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 surgical for the uh, any surgery in her cervix. Um, any uh, pelvic surgery or any abdominal surgery, uh, what current medication she's taking, um, and uh, if taking any contraceptive or hypertensive or uh, um, any other medication. Uh, then about her surgical uh, history already I mentioned, medication, allergies, uh, and her uh, social history, social history for smoking, alcohol, uh, and her, uh, if she's a drug abuser or she's, uh, uh, what's uh, her occupation, and I will ask her about family history of any cervical cancer, any DET, any um, uh, history of uh, uh, um, any cardiac or uh, hematology disease. Then I'll do the investigation, the uh, sorry, uh, physical examination. In the physical examination, I will uh, take her BMI. I will do general examination. Uh, I will check the patient looking pale or uh, any um, uh, uh, neck swelling, uh, then chest examination, then breast examination, then abdominal examination, palpating the abdomen for any uh, uh, mass. Uh, then I'll do a pelvic examination, checking for inspecting the bulba for any. Um, uh, lesion or any uh, like uh, condyloma lata or condyloma acuminata and then I will uh, check uh, if there is any estrogen uh, deficiency, uh, the synthesis of the estrogen, then I'll do speculum examination uh, for the patient to check for any polyp or any uh, local cause for the, um, for the bleeding. Uh, after that, uh, I will uh, examine, uh, um, I will take high vaginal swab for the patient if there is any discharge and pub smear if it was done uh, three years ago or if there is any changes in her previous pub smear. Um, then I will do a lower limb examination and then I will uh, go for uh, ultrasound. Uh, um, ultrasound. In ultrasound, I will check the endometrial thickness, any, um, any ovarian mass or ovarian cyst, any polyp. Uh, uh, and um, I will uh, then uh, request in the, for investigation for a CBC um, to check for hemoglobin, platelet level. And uh, I will uh, do the routine other investigation like uh, liver function test and uh, renal fun function test and thyroid function test and prolactin and um, also the uh, prolactin FSH, uh, uh, sorry, t uh, thyroid, stimula thyroid stimulating hormone and the prolactin and uh, CBC electrolyte LFTRT and then uh, I will discuss uh, the diagnosis and management accordingly. Uh, it could be due uh, to contraceptive bill if she just started contraceptive and uh, she started to have a spotting. Uh, it could be due to uh, cervical uh, um, ectropion. 
ectropion and um, the, the management will be according to the uh, if it's OCB I will reassure the patient if it's ectropion I will uh, and there's changes in the, in the cervix I will take pap smear and according to the pap smear result whether there is any changes and like uh, low grade squamous intrabithelial lesion or high squamous intrabithelial lesion I will uh, advise the patient for colposcopy and if there is any uh, uh, and I will take cone biopsy if there is any uh, visible lesion and the, and the management will be accordingly if there is thickening in the endometrial thickness uh, with polyp uh, I will uh, uh, remove the polyp and uh, polypectomy if the, uh, and if um, by by, hystero by hysteroscopy, I will do the resection of uh, if it's endometrium. If it's in the cervix, uh, we can uh, do it, uh, and if it's it's clear, we can do it in the office. By the forceps, we can remove the polyp, uh, and uh, using nitrile, um, nitrogen nitrogen. Uh, um, I think that's it. No, there you have mentioned uh, all the points. Don't worry about that. So, what will be your differential diagnosis? It could be uh, cervical polyp. It could be ectropion of the cervix. It could be using of OCB. Uh, it could be uh, uh, any uh, cervical uh, uh, lesion like. Uh, uh, or mal or malignancy even. Uh, Oh, it could be even beta HCG. I did not request beta HCG for her. Um, yeah. I forget. It could be like an early pregnancy, <laughs> which she is not sure about, uh, or threaten abortion. I think this is my differential. Yeah, that is the point. Yeah. So that is the in you know you in the OSCE, you don't have to mention like all 10 causes. There can be so many causes, like from local causes to systemic causes, and then to the drugs she is taking. Okay, these are the points. So this patient is there, she is young, she is only 27. So uh, as a general rule, the younger patients they are likely to have they're likely to have more infections, and the older people they are more likely to have the infections like that. Okay, that is one thing. So what you will do here, they ask you that how you will gather uh, relevant information. So you will say that I will take, um, I will ask this patient, uh, I will take a brief history. What happened when they started? What was the timing? What was the, what is the duration, pattern, timing, amount, and frequency of bleeding? And also what is her normal cycle? And uh, is she having any withdrawal bleeds? She is using anything? So you, you didn't ask me that what is the regular method of contraception. Otherwise, I will, I'll tell you that that is COCPs like that. And then even if he's using COCPs, you need to be sure that her compliance is good, that she is taking the drug regularly at the same time. Because uh, the most common cause of failure will be if the patient is taking irregularly and then she can have the side effects also. So we need to elicit uh, this history of this, um, that why she's having this um, bleeding like what is the amount intermittent associated with this peronia or what? Then is there any vaginal discharge? What is the smear history? Is she a smoker? And then uh, did she ever have this termination of pregnancy? Termination of pregnancy can be due to many reasons, like patient is running some infection. We are not offering, so, but maybe she has suffered some miscarriage like that. After that, we have to do the examination, general physical examination, how the patient looks. She should be anxious because she is having a bleed. Then we have to check the vital signs, abdominal examination for any tenderness, any problem. Then we have to do inspection of the vulva and vagina, and uh, we will do that in the presence of a chaperon. And then we need to look at the cervix, and always whenever you will do examination, you will explain to the patient that I, that I will in introduce something inside because I want to look at the neck of the womb. Then I will look for trophy, we, I will look for polyps, any suspicious lesions, and the friability. Then I will take the history of the cervical smears and then any other uh, if required. If the uh, smear has been taken, that is well and good. Otherwise, this is the time to take it because you can exclude any uh, uh, malignancy like that or pre malignant conditions. Then you should say, I will take genital tract swabs, I will take high vaginal swabs, endocervical or uh, endocervical swabs, and the low vaginal swabs. And then you can consider pelvic ultrasound to see that there is no physical method. 
physical mass is not there. Then diagnosis and management, we will look for intermenstrual bleeding. Like uh, if she's having breakthrough bleeding, then maybe she has started taking the COCPs. That's why she's having it. So we will say that you will take, you will ask her to continue the same method of contraception till the results of the swabs they are awaited. So once we get them, we can always tell her that this she is having an infection and that can be managed by giving antibiotics. If she is having postcoital bleeding, then it may also be related to common causes like the physical physical causes, like there is something at the cervix. But we need to take the smear. Why? Or but ask for the smear results because we cannot take it for granted. Maybe she is already having some dyscariosis. And we have to exclude other genital tract infections. If she has discharge, they will tell you typical thing, like she has copious pinkish discharge just before her periods. And this discharge continues even after her periods, but that is less now. Then you have to think about cervical ectopy. Some genital tract infections, they will also cause heavy vaginal discharge. Polyps, they can also cause discharge. So if the tests are normal, you should say, I will reassure my patient and I will explain that the cervical ectopy is there because maybe this patient is using COCPs. Then if she's taking COCPs and she's having bleeding, then we need to change the form of the COCPs from one variety to another variety. Maybe the second one will provide better control and it will cause less cervical ectopy. Then we will say, if, I were, if we found any genital tract infection on investigation, we will try to treat that with appropriate medicines like antibiotics or antifungal drugs. And then in that case, I will refer her to the genital urinary medicine clinic. You know, they have gum clinic in Saudi Arabia, also infectious disease experts. They are doing the same job for contact tracing and, and treatment of the husband or the like if she's like that. Or for the treatment, some they will ask you that husband needs treatment. Yes, in some conditions he needs, in others he doesn't need. So if she is a candidate, like previously she had some cervical abnormality, then we will ask, and she is having this bleeding, then we can ask her that when was the last time, and you can take the previous one, and if still you have any concerns, you can repeat the smears and you can do the carposcopy also. Outpatient hysteroscopy can be indicated, and if we have seen any polyp, then outpatient polypectomy under hysteroscopy that can be indicated. Then the causes can be non-menstrual, and that is also common. Like over seven, seven uh, like uh, six months period, seven to ten percent of the women they will complain of having intermenstrual bleeding, and the postcoital bleeding also is seen in two to four percent. And most of these women with unscheduled non-menstrual bleedings, they do not have any significant underlying law or cause, but the problem is that if they will have some bleeding, it is going to be like very much stressful for them. So if you will have, you will just try to find the cause. If a cause is found, we are going to treat that according to the protocol. If no cause is found, then we, we will uh, review her method of contraception and we will change it to another form like that. If she is having like severe bleeding with the COCPs, then we can say that, tell her that initially it is common, but within three months it will settle. But if she has like more bleeding, it continues, then she should come back. Another condition can be like she, she is having some GID abnormality, like there are any malabsorption syndrome or she has inflammatory bowel disease. So that, uh, either she is not taking the drug uh, pills properly or the content of the pills, they are not absorbed from the GIT properly. That is one thing. So that's why she is not having the effective level of the drug. Or if she has diarrhea, even then she can have the same effect. So then the genital tract infections, they can cause it, but they will be friable friable cervix. Friable cervix, the one which is going to bleed on top. That is one thing. If there is a mitral dyscariosis, then you will have to test them for the high risk human papilloma virus. And found to be positive, then we will send her to the for the colposcopy. Polyp or something is found, then you are going to um, remove that. In the past, what we do to, used to do, like we used to offer this cryo, like the cautery or the thermocautery, cryocautery, but now it is not done very frequently. So we are just taking the swabs and we are offering the typing of the DFHPV. And then according to that, patient can go, can be referred to the higher center. 
So in these patients, you will see, I will look at the results, I will collect them, and then I will treat according to the cause. So once you will say that, they will give you a cause, and then if he has PID, just mention that I will give him the treatment for it. And if no obvious cause is found, then you will say that I will review her usual method of contraception, and then we can make any plan for her. Okay, thank you. So next station for Dr. Mariam. You will this conference will now be recorded. Yeah. So um, I will go to see the patient after I took this myself to her. I will confirm her identification data, her name, her age. Uh, then I will ask her about uh, when was her last menstrual period. Uh, I will ask her what is her month complaint, uh, when she was having her uh, intercourse, uh, if she remembered how many hours, uh, and why she is requesting the emergency contraception, if she is uh, applying for uh, uh, not to conceive or there is any medical problem she had. Uh, I will specifically ask if she's having any uh, history of diabetes, uh, hypertensive, cardiac disease, uh, any previous uh, history of thromboembolism uh, disease. If she's taking any specific uh, medication, if she's on uh, any previous uh, contraception, uh, was she uh, failed or it was, uh, yeah, she forgot or she was. Uh, not in uh, any contraception before. Uh, does she, uh, she have any history of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease or baby bleeding? Uh, then I will ask about her past uh, menstrual history. Is it regular, irregular? Uh, how, uh, how many days? And if there is any history of intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding? Uh, regarding her past uh, obstetric history, if she gets pregnant before and how many children she has? Uh, past gyne history, if she's having any sexually transmitted disease before, uh, any history of pelvic inflammatory disease, any, uh, any significant in her gyne history, uh, uh, like uh, recent uh, updated to bab smear or not, uh, any history of, uh, regarding the past medical history, any specific for cardiac, thromboembolism, she's secular, um, diabetic or hypertensive, uh, any surgery done for her. And uh, I will ask if she's smoking regarding social history. Her, uh, she's smoking, uh, taking alcohol, drugs, uh, and any family history significant, uh, especially to malignancy. Then I will uh, discuss with her uh, regarding her uh, option of, uh, um, con uh, of contraception after a full examination to check her, uh, her vital signs, specifically for blood pressure and height and weight. Uh, for BMI, then I will uh, do for her quick examination. Uh, then I will tell her that she's having uh, so many options regarding for uh, the period of con uh, of intercourse. If it is within three days, or if it is within uh, like more five uh, five days or uh, seven days, uh, she has an option that uh, plan B, uh, plan A. Uh, we can give her uh, progesterone. Uh, I will remember that was uh, yeah dose the uh, 1.5 mg. You can yeah, say that we can yes. give her uh, just a second, Mariam. Yeah. You will yeah. say that we can give her hormonal contraception or non-hormonal contraception. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, regarding hormonal contraception, we can give her uh, a progesterone, a 1.5 uh, milligram uh, stat dose, uh, or we can uh, stat dose single dose, and this is uh, effective up to five days. Uh, or we can give her compliant uh, oral contraceptive uh, if it is uh, uh, the estradiol uh, around 35 uh, micrograms so she can take uh, two tablets uh, 12 hours apart uh, for doses uh, uh, four tablets yeah, uh, or we sh she can take uh, high dose of estradiol uh, it will be one tablet uh, for two doses 12 uh, hours apart or we can offer for her uh, ulipistol. This is uh, an, uh, anti progesterone. Uh, this is uh, the dose 30 milligrams, that dose single dose. This is also effective up to five days from the intercourse. She can take also metabestone, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know the dose. Or we can offer for her IUCD, this is copper. Uh, this is effective up to seven days and from the intercourse. Uh, but I have to explain for her regarding the risk uh, of perforation, bleeding, 
uh, if she gets pregnant, she may there is uh, some complication like COVID pregnancy. Uh, and then uh, uh, whatever she had, uh, so I will apply to the patient. I will follow up her uh, after seven to eight, uh, seven days. She get uh, she will get her period. If uh, her period delayed up to ten days, uh, I will request from the patient to do the pregnancy test. Yeah. So 30 milligram is the dose, 30 microgram, 30 mg is the dose for the unit tester. Okay, yeah, that's it. Okay, so the IUCD, so if then you have given that treatment, what would you like to do after a while? Are you going to call her for follow up? Yes. Um, if she's in uh, IUCD, I will explain to the patient if she wants to continue uh, uh, for the IUCD uh, or she will uh, remove it after uh, she gets her period. Suppo uh, she's uh, supposed to get, have her period after seven days. If her period delayed up to 10 days, we will, uh, I will request for her uh, pregnancy test. If she is pregnant, mm -hmm. I will explain to the patient that there is a risk of abortion. And either way, I will... Uh, Either we remove or we will keep the IUCD, there is a risk of abortion. So I will uh, ask the patient just better to remove the IUCD. If she refused, uh, I will explain for her or, or the risk. Uh, and then this is uh, her chance. If she wants to continue her uh, IUCD or she wants to remove it uh, just for like an emergency. Uh, so if you give her tablets, then you will not do pregnancy test. Okay, you know, if you are if you are if you are giving them uliprestel or levonorgestrel, even for them you have to do the pregnancy test. Hmm. Why? Because it is important to see that they are not pregnant. That is the point. Mm -hmm. And whenever you will give a drug, you should always say what benefit will be from this drug and what complication will be there, what type of drug is drug is this one, and when it is contraindicated like that. Okay? So all of these things you should say. So the LNG, you know that that is uh, progesterone. And what about uliprestal acetate? What type of drug is that one? Progesterone. Progesterone receptor modulated. You know why I'm asking you? Because all students, they make mistake in the wording. You know, the reloxifene and tamoxifene, those are SERMs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Selective estrogen receptor modulated. Mm -hmm. And the uliprestal acetate, that is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. Mm -hmm. That is the point. Okay? That is one thing. So then you tell me another thing that when it will be contraindicated to give uliprestal acetate. Is there, is there any such contraindication? Um, I have just ruled out that the patient, she's not my uh, like. Uh, a thromboembolism, she's not a cardiac disease, uh, she's not hypertensive, uh, she's not a uh, known case of migraine because sometimes you'll be uh, repeated in the migraine attack. Uh, okay. Yeah, if the patient is allergic to that one, basically, if they are allergic, then they should not take it. Basic contraindication is allergic. allergic. And then if she's using, like, uh, she has stomach disease, GERD, or she's using antiretroviral therapy, heart therapy, or she is using like glucocorticoids, inhalers, and they said simetidine, then she should not use it. That is the point, okay? And then mm -hmm. we should also say that uh, levonorgestrel and uh, this one, levonorgestrel and LNG, level and uliprestal. They can be given just once a cycle or they can be given multiple times. Multiple times, both can be given multiple times. Okay, no contraindication to that one. Mm -hmm. They can be given multi uh, multiple times like that. So you don't have to worry about that. Multiple times we can give. They both have some benefits. They have some advantages, some disadvantages. Then they can ask you that, um, you know, uh, this postpartum unprotected sexual intercourse is just one of the indications. Sometimes if the patient forgets to take her regular method of contraception, then again, it will be indicated like that. 
yeah, the contraindication of ulipristal acetate, if the patient is on glucocorticoids, she has like the gastroesophageal reflux disease, and uh, she is taking antacids, and uh, why? Because then this drug will not be that effective, okay? Then if the patient has hepatic failure, renal failure, and then if he is using heart therapy, that is also one contraindication. So, then the problem is since this is progesterone receptor modulator, so it is going to compete for the progesterone sites. So then you will have to give additional contraception in some forms. Let that's why you, you know this EC is very important topic for the exam also. I will let's go over it quickly. So EC is indicated for occasional use to reduce the risk of pregnancy after OPC, and it will not replace the effective regular contraception. And then another thing is that if the woman has not taken her uh, regular method of contraception appropriately, then we will have to give it. So the patient comes to you. You can tell them that there are two route, uh, two types like hormonal, non-hormonal, and the routes oral and the non-oral, and they can be given. What are the indications? They can be given uh, given from day five after miscarriage, abortion, ectopic pregnancy, uterine evacuation, for uh, gestation, prophylactic disease. Then after long hormonal contraception has been compromised or it has been used incorrectly, then IUCD insertion and after an extended pill free interval and after a missed POP pill like that. If she has missed the, like um, she has passed the duration of this implanon, next one on, or this LNG, it, it should have been used, removed, but patient forgot to get it removed, then the contraceptive efficacy has been lost. So that's why then we will, and the oopsie has occurred, Let's say at five years and three months, she's having oopsie. So this drug has, uh, this uh, LNG, Marina, has already expired. So even then, this emergency contraception is indicated. So woman has come to you. You are going to take the history, what exactly she is taking from the start. And then um, what, what was the nature of this oopsie? You have asked her, then you will say that uh, that is the only method, this copper IUCD, which is effective after ovulation has taken place. Why? Because it is going to interfere with the implantation. So uh, that is the point. So then care has to be taken for emergency contraception should be given within five days after the first oopsie in a cycle or within five days of the earliest estimated date of the ovulation if the patient is having regular contraception. If the weight of the patient is more than 70 kg, then you will have to give her double dose of levonorgestrel. And if the weight is more than 70 kg or the BMI is more than 26, then this patient will need two doses of the levonorgestrel. So usually we are giving 1.5, but in this case, you have to give 3 mg. That is the point. For ulipristal, same dose. IUCD, no change. So patient has come to you for the contraception, what you will do? Important thing, confirm the diagnosis, even for the exam sake, they will ask you, just tell them that we need to take full history, um, introduction, what is her regular method of using contraception, and uh, what was the time when she had this UPSI, and uh, what is the routine contraceptive method, important to ask that if she's using any method or not. When was the LMP? Then very important to ask that did she consent for the sex? Was it was it consensual or not? What is the past medical history? Does this vision is uh, generally is doing very well or not? Then you have to counsel about the available methods. LNG, levonorgestrel. So it will act by exact mechanism unknown. Whenever you are mentioning a drug, you have to say that what type of drug is this one? What is the mode of action? So level not just true, this is a progesterone and the mode of action exactly unknown, but it is thought that it acts by inhibiting or delaying ovulation and it will prevent follicular rupture. So single dose of 1.5 mg should be given and if the patient vomits within two hours, then you will have to repeat the full dose. Efficacy, it is very effective if it is taken within 72 hours, but up to 796 hours, it is effective. And um, after that, we cannot use it. It can be taken more than once in the cycle. EMI is more than 26 or weight more than 70. She will have to take 3 mg or double dose. 
in epileptics also we will have to give three milligrams then the second drug that is ulipristal acetate this is a selective progesterone receptor modulator mode of action inhibition or inhibition of ovulation or it will delay ovulation and this one is going to be effective even if the patient had this alleged surge but now she has uh, uh, taken this ulipristal still it can arrest this ovulation that is the benefit so tablet uh, tablet should be taken as soon as the patient remembers and should be taken within 120 hours and if she vomits within three hours then you will have to give full dose that is the point so if the patient is on combined hormonal contraception then barrier contraception it has to be used until withdrawal bleeding is going to occur. it has certain contraindications what are the contraindications for ulipristal like if the patient is allergic to the contents of the ulipristal then hypersensitivity then severe hepatic impairment then severe asthma all of these are the contraindications like for this method like that then for the next is breastfeeding after giving this ulipristal acetate the breastfeeding should be stopped for seven days he has certain side effects like abdominal pain menstrual disorders a patient can have irregular periods and they can have like premenstrual syndrome like condition you try in cramps irregular vaginal bleeding and very important to remember that ulipristal has important drug interactions like liver enzyme inducers like nitronavir carbamazepine phenytoin rifampicin st john's wort they are going to decrease the efficacy so concurrent use of antacids hq receptors blockers like cimetidine and proton pump inhibitors it is going to decrease absorption of the jewelry crystal, so it will not be that effective. So then they can, these patients, uh, they will have to use barrier method of contraception also like that. So these patients, uh, if they have taken jewelry crystal acetate and they were using combined pills, then they should take an additional method like the barrier method for the next 14 days. Why? Because the jewelry crystal is going to compete with the progesterone receptors so this uh, the cocps that we are giving they also contain progesterone so they will have no effect that's why uh, we have to increase the dose of cocps so better than increasing the dose that we should give them because if the receptor is not available then your patient is not going to benefit from it so better to give a barrier method of contraception for how many days 14 days if she, she was on cocps if patient pass on progesterone only pills, then we need to give this additional barrier method for nine days. If patient pass on Culera, in Culera, you, you know that patient will have estradiol, valerate, and denogest. Then she should take additional precaution for 16 days. IUD, that is the method of choice. And if they give you epileptic, you know, in the epileptic, the, if, she, if she has no contraindication, then the most suitable method and most reliable method is going to be IUCD. That should be offered, first of all. If she's not having any infection and no uterine malformation, you should give IUCD. So it can be used for multiple episodes and the pregnancy test in all situations you have to do after three months. That is the point, okay? So then how you would use that you want to give the ulipristal or the levonorgestrel? gestrel Of course, you should know the history and then you should know that you, the time. Within the coming early, then you can give any one of them equally effective. But if she's coming like after the 120 hours, then you should try to give ulipristal like that. If she's coming between 96 and 120 hours, then you should know that Eleven or gestural is ineffective, so better we should give her unit tested acetate. If she is coming before 96 hours, then it should it depends upon the certain factors like that. So you they will not ask you the details, so don't have to remember. Just remember the contraindications, and then so better coming within 24 within 96 hours, so you can give any one of them. No contraindication for that. Okay? So that is like simple information don't have to worry about it okay Sorry. so who will do the next station please Sorry. this conference will you now be okay. recorded ideally you should start the pills within five days of the menstrual cycle that is the ideal time and no need for the additional contraception if the, but if you start sorry if you will start that after like seven days 
in that case you will need and you can need some additional contraception like that so anytime you want to start you have to exclude pregnancy if the patient is postpartum and not breastfeeding then we can start on day 21 and if he's fully breastfeeding then we should start after six months this is for the cocps and it should be can be started within five days if the post miscarriage without need for additional contraception otherwise he can use a barrier method so they can use barrier methods or they can practice abstinence for seven days then regarding the progesterone only pills they should be started on day one of the cycle and she will take one pill every single day so it can be started up to and it including the day five up to day five in which that one two three four five day one is the one when she started to menstruate and if she's starting even on day five she doesn't need any additional contraception if she is starting after day five and the woman is not pregnant then and needs additional contraception for 48 hours she's starting pops on the day five then she needs after day five like starting on day six then she should use additional contraception for 48 hours and it can be started up to and including the date 21 postpartum without need for additional contraception cover and then it can be started within five days of termination of pregnancy or miscarriage if it occurred at less than 24 weeks and progesterone only pills a woman can continue till the age of 55 years if there are no contraindications then when to start progesterone only implants and the injectables ideally they should be started in the first five days of the cycle and no additional contraception needed and they can be inserted at any time any other time provided the woman is not pregnant and she can use barrier methods or abstinence for seven days and it can be started up to and including day 21 postpartum without need for additional contraception and if she started after day 21 then we will have to use barrier method or abstinence for seven days and it can be started five days of termination of pregnancy or miscarriage without need for additional contraception if starting after day five then they will have to use now we are talking about the progesterone only large methods like that okay? then she will have to use if you are starting later then she, after day five we will advise barrier method of contraception or abstinence for seven days then the question is that when to start myrena it better it is if, if it is inserting the first five days after menstrual cycle without need for any additional contraception if she is starting this method after after this time after day five of the cycle like day six then she will have to use barrier method or abstinence for seven days postpartum either we should insert within 48 hours or then she should it should be inserted four weeks later then when we can start the copper iucd the same it can be started at any time if we are reasonably sure that patient is not using any patient is not pregnant right now and the copper IUD is effective immediately, but you should remember that Myrena is not effective immediately. It needs at least seven days before it will be effective, and then, but the IUCD immediately it is effective. So it can also be inserted within 48 hours, or it can be delayed until four weeks postpartum. If your patient has missed some pills, what should be done? So in women presenting with having missed her pills, it is important to know when to provide emergency contraception if there is a risk of pregnancy. Regarding COCPs, if one or two missed pills, it means that these are the 30 microgram pills, or she has missed one pill when the amount of estrogen was just 20 microgram. So 30 microgram, she can miss one or two pills, but if it was like 20 microgram and she has missed one pill, so it means that she should take the pill as soon as possible and no contraception required when one or two pills. Now, if she has missed three or more pills, 30 microgram or two or more pills of the low dose, then she will take the pill as quickly as soon as she remembers and continue taking the pills and avoid as usual and avoid sex or use barrier method for seven days if the missed pills they are in the law in the first week of the pair that's that is day zero to seven then emergency contraception if oopsie has taken place on the or first seven days of the 
after the in the pill free interval like before she had the periods or day one to day seven of the pack here the emergency contraception is required the general rule is that you need to give seven pills to stop the ovaries in pro producing eggs and then if you want the ovaries to become effective again you have to relieve relieve the stop the pill for seven days and then ovaries will become functional so pill free interval when we stop the medicine and then the patient had the sex so if the sex has occurred during that time or we have started the pack like on the day in the first week day zero when she is day one will be when she started this menstruation okay so if she has not so if if in these seven days without completing the first seven tabs oopsie occurs then emergency contraception is recommended if the patient missed pills in the second week that is day 8 to 14 no need for emergency contraception day 0 to day 7 or day 1 to 7 yes emergency contraception required day 8 to 14 emergency contraception not required and if she has taken that is also essential that in the first week she has taken the pills regularly then in the second week nothing is required if she didn't take the pills regularly in the first week then a oopsie occurred during day 8 to 14 then she will need emergency contraception but if she has taken the medicine successfully then she doesn't need any emergency contraception if the missed pill is in the third week that is day 15 to 21 then no need for additional contraception what she will no need for um, you know this emergency contraception but she will tell the patient that she should not observe pill free interval so pack to pack she should start the new pack okay so basically you should remember that if oopsie occurred from day zero to seven why are they are telling you day zero because it was a, a, a sex was done in the um, pill free interval but the period still didn't start so at that time she will need she will need emergency contraception but at other points of the cycle she will not need emergency contraception she will just need that she should use um, in the third week that she should not have this pill free interval that is the thing okay? so these are the rules for the uh, combined pills now the progesterone only pills we have traditional pills so if they are the patient more than three hours late or more than 27 hours from the last pill then patient will take the pill as soon as she rem remembered and then take the next pill at the usual time so she will take it means that she will be having two pills on the same day in then in that case if she has missed one pill and she took the second pill very late she will use additional contraceptive cover like the barrier or abstinence for at least two days and if she vomits within two hours of taking the pill another pill should be taken that so these are the for the progesterone only simple if she has missed one tablet and uh, it means that next day she will take the pill and she will have to use emergency contraception for two days also or she, she should practice like um, abstinence it should be there or she should use the cont additional contraceptive cover like the uh, barrier method if she was taking non-traditional pills like serazet and the more than 12 hours late or more than 36 hours from the last pill then it means that she should take the pill as soon as she remembered and take next pill as per the usual time like maybe she has missed two pills 36 hours passed now suddenly she remembered so she should take the pill and she should take the regular pill also so patient should use additional contraceptive cover like the barrier or abstinence for the at least two days and if she vomits within two days so it means that she should take another pill so you can see for the both types of uh, restaurants the time limit here is 36 hours for the serazet and 27 hours for other pills so if she will miss any pill she will have to go for emergency contraception or she will go for the barrier method and if she's like having these problems in the first week then we will have to give her in cocps in the first week then we will have to give her emergency contraception if she will miss the pills in from day zero to seven we will give them emergency contraception if it occurs between day 8 to 14 nothing is required okay? 
and provided she has taken seven pills regularly. If she has taken the pills irregularly, then again, you will have to give her emergency contraception. If the OOPSI occurs in the third week of the cycle, then uh, you will have to omit, leave the pill-free interval and patient will eat pack to pack. So one pack she will finish, the next pack she is going to start. Then she doesn't need any additional contraception at that time. So is it clear or there is any problem, anything, then please tell me. Okay. Clear, but so this you just... Yeah. Yeah, tell me, so what you will do if your patient has taken some medicine? Okay. You know, don't worry. This document that how you will take a detailed history if your patient has like uh, emergency contraception, this key is already available. Everything I said that is available on your web page. Okay, don't worry about it. Because you need to revise everything before the exam. Any question, any problem? Okay, so who will do the third station? Okay, Victoria. Yes, Victoria. Okay, you. Okay. So two persons have spoken or one? One. Me. Okay. Just take your time, two minutes, and then Me you also. can start. Okay, you will do the station. Me, no, Victoria. Yeah, anyone who spoke first. Actually, you know my screen was not on. I didn't see that who spoke first. So Marwa wants to do, and who else wants to do? Okay, no, no problem. Because. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marwa, you do one session. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. And then the next one, Najla, you also have to do. And who is here at number six today? Aisha, I can see here. So then this, uh, then, uh, this attendee six, you also have to do one session. Okay, like that. So Marwa, you will read this one and then you will tell me, I will move it. Yes, Victoria, can I start? Yeah, just a moment. You know, here we have something else also. Oh, okay. This is the, these are the results only, okay? Okay, mm -hmm. now we can start. This Please conference will now be recorded. Okay. She is a referral. Yeah, she is referral from the GP. Uh, she is uh, Miss Amal uh, with history of the hot flushes and irregular period with lab result. After I introduce myself to the patient, I will tell her uh, you are referral because uh, you have some problem with the lab result. As before you discuss the, your um, uh, the, your result and the plan of the management, I will take from you uh, some question about the, your relative, relevant uh, complaint and the history. I will ask about her, her age, uh, parity, uh, last menstrual period, and age of the menarche, uh, regular to her period for how many days, uh, la, la, flow, flow, any intramenstrual cycle bleeding, any post bleeding, dysmenorrhea or dyspironia. Uh, what about hair irregularity, uh, last uh, attack of the irregularity of the hair uh, bleeding? And I will ask about her uh, heart flushes, uh, severity, duration, severity if associated with the, uh, at what specific time in the day the heart flushes, if associated with palpitation, not uh, sweating and uh, shivering, if there is any sleep uh, sleep disturbance or mood change, any vaginal atrophy or incontinence or urinary symptom, bowel symptom, if she is sexually active or not, any history of the sexual dysfunction or, uh, or uh, decreased libido with the dysphoronia. 
uh, she has history of the anxiety or depression, any, uh, you, uh, any history of the UTI, uh, recurrent UTI, or she is seek any medical advice, receive any treatment or uh, any investigation. If she did pap smear or, uh, or uh, any update result of the pap smear, if this symptom affect her life or uh, sexual uh, activity, uh, I will ask about her. Uh, 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 her uh, her life about her eating. Uh, she is a lot. Uh, she drink a lot of caffeine or hot drug, smoking or alcoholic. About her diet. Uh, uh, she is eat, eat a spicy diet a lot or weight gain or weight loss. Uh, then I will ask about the her menstrual uh, history. If she did any pap smear, STDs, any gynae surgery she did or any investigation or any examination uh, from the gynae clinic. The past obstetric history, the mood of delivery, the parity, the mood of delivery, last delivery. If she has any medical problem, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, hypertension, DM, or any thromboembolism, or thromboembolism. Uh, past surgical history, and if she did any surgical history, uh, abdominal history, uh, gynae history, uh, appendectomy, and uh, family history, if any have family history of the thromboembolism, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, of the, any uh, malignancy in the her family, uh, social history, smoking, alcoholic, or any exercise. Uh, and then uh, this is about the relevant history. Then okay. about her investigation, I will explain to her this is investigation uh, done because her irregular period or she is if, if maybe she is uh, premenopausal or uh, any affect her hormonal activity uh, imbalance. The FSH, FSH normal, LH normal with thyroid is normal because there is a thyroid, if there is any thyroid problem, they affect her period. Also their FSH and LH, if there is any uh, uh, sign if there is a mini boss or not, uh, may I request for her repeated FSH to make sure uh, maybe high best patient in her in uh, mini boss. Uh, then I will request for her uh, after dinner, after I examine her, may I request for her uh, baby smear of not taking, I will take for her baby smear, I will do ultrasound, pelvic ultrasound to make sure any uh, uterine leg and the endometrial thickness uh, to uh, order for her the endometrial biopsy. Uh, according to the result, uh, uh, I will uh, treat her. If there is anything normal, I will explain to her maybe this is a sign of her uh, menopause. Uh, we advise her uh, about how to flush us to uh, uh, make the exercise, change her uh, diet habit, stop smoking or alcoholic. Uh, and, uh, mm, Uh, and then uh, she is, uh, I will explain to her the most affected uh, affected for uh, relief, the hot flushes to use the HRT. After I explain to her the indication and contraindication for uh, HRT, uh, or uh, there is hormonal or no hormonal uh, treatment for menopausal symptom, we can offer her SSRI, uh, clonidine, and uh, uh, I forget the name of the drugs, SSRI. No problem. Yes. Yes. Selective serotonin receptor. Yes. Yes. Peroxetine. Uh, that's very good. Peroxetine. Yes. Citalopram. Yes. Citalopram. Better than fluoxetine. Yes. I will explain to her the HRT, the contraindication. If there is active uh, thromboembolism or undiagnosed BP bleeding, any if she is known case of liver disease, active liver disease, or uh, any breast cancer or endometrial cancer. Uh, and there is some herbal medication, but it's still not approved uh, from the VDA. Uh, we can use it, but uh, according to the patient. Mm. Yeah. Can That's all. Can about the contemporary therapies that we don't have any trials, so we are concerned about their safety. So we uh, maybe they are effective, but we have evidence of benefit for only two things, black cohosh and soya. Oh, okay, okay. They can have many important drug interactions and they can cause problems. Yes, after I explain to her, I will give her uh, appointment uh, to follow up the result and if she think what you want to use and uh, to come back again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that is the thing give her patient information leaflet then what is the age of this patient did they mention what so you should and you should question about that also that what is the age of this patient and yes, then you like you will go you will introduce and you will say that i'm the doctor covering it today nice to meet you what has happened is there any problem so what are you feeling i have come to know that you have hot flushes like that so can you exactly tell me what is the problem then she will tell that uh, what is she having uh, once she will describe the symptoms then you will say that i will check that uh, i will ask her to tell me more about her periods and then is she taking any form of contraception now combined pills or anything now then i will ask her that do you do you have any problem with your sex life like you have dryness low desire or you have like pain any problem is there then tell me about that how has been your uh, mood and then how um, your urination and other problems are the same uh, do you feel tired do you sleep well are your smears up to the date then in the obstetric history do you have children any family is complete medical history are you following up with your gp with for any problem do you have diabetes hypertension any problem any history of having blood clots in the family any history of any surgery anything or in the in your sisters or your mother and this patient may tell you that uh, this patient actually was a case that when you will ask her that the examiner will tell you that she has history of breast cancer before and she was taking this tamoxifen like that so after that you will say that uh, is there any family history of concerns cancers or um, like um, clots and then this patient had any surgery before what is the social history what do you do for what she does for living and uh, what is her support system is she happy with life or she has any problems then i will say okay you want to call somebody or you want me to give you the full information or you want you you like to have the information in small chunks or you want me to give you full information like that so you will see that we have done certain hormonal tests on you and we have just come to find that your levels are showing that your periods have stopped so or they are decreasing so we anticipate that in future you are going to have other problems so if the examiner will ask you that do you think she is having menopause you will say no she is having perimenopause the stage before the periods will stop completely that is the problem okay then you will say that the symptom of such problems is that for lifestyle measures should be changed hormonal treatment can be given non hormonal treatment can be given lifestyle modifications include reducing caffeine alcohol intake if she is taking stopping this exercise and she should do some form of exercise and uh, then we can give her hrt which is uh, useful uh, which is successful in 80 to 90% of the women and you can also say i will tell her that 8 to 9 women uh, like her in 100 women and then for the sex she can use the local water based lubricants for dryness and she can use that medicine also and then you will say that in your case the hrt may not be indicated because this patient has history of breast cancer okay she was on tamoxifen so we can give you other drugs like peroxetine or fluoxetine we call them the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors you have to tell the examiner that you you have not just learned one word which is ssris you actually know that what is sri so options for you are lifestyle measures, lubricants to help you with dryness, and we can give you SSRIs. We are, uh, don't uh, use any other herbal medications because we don't know about them. They are alternatives, but we don't know that what they can do to your system like that. And then you will say, since this is a complicated case, she has history of breast cancer also. So you will say that I will uh, fix and arrange an appointment for you. Uh, in the menopause clinic with a specialist who is going to discuss your condition and give you the best advice so here you have to tell her that you are playing very safe because she's a breast cancer survivor on some form of hormonal therapy so you don't want to do anything so that's all you need to tell her then you can say that other drugs other things like um, herbal medicines they have some evidence of benefit but you should not use it because we don't know exactly how, what they can do to you like that so soya products they may improve your menopausal symptoms or black cohorts they can have but yet the problem is that they will have some estrogenic effects and regarding antidepressants when lafaxin that seems to be more most effective and if that doesn't suit you we can give you peroxetine or fluoxetine 
clonidine patches, they are also very helpful for this condition and treatment that do not work and they are not safe, you should not be using them. But there are treatments, these treatments, if they ask you, are there any contemporary treatments? You will say that several are available, but they are not found to be effective, like evening primrose oil, ginseng, then kawa kawa, then the beta blockers, and then high dose of vitamin E because, um, uh, you know, all of these, they can help, but even the high dose of vitamin E, like the Deflon we are giving to everyone, but it may be harmful. Why? Because they are producing reactive oxygen radicals in the body. Then progesterone hormone, it may help with the hot flushes, but it may also increase the risk of having breast cancer reactivation. So she should not use any herbal medicines because they have not been regulated. So we are going to refer you to the um, endocrine, to the, endo, uh, to the person who is expert in dealing the conditions like you. So he will give you further information. So you are going to tell her, uh, tell this patient and the examiner that it will be much better if she will get advice from the uh, menopause specialist. Why? Because we want to decrease the risk of this patient because she's a breast cancer survivor. This conference will now be recorded. Yeah. So what would you like to ask her? Can you tell me about this case? Yeah, the focus is to the doctorate uh, general. Yeah. yeah. First of all, I will introduce myself and yeah. will ask the patient uh, when she uh, started any uh, how, for how long she is sexually active? Did she use any contraceptive before? Regarding her uh, epilepsy, epilepsy, what medication she is on? And for the attack of trisomy, the, the, the TIA, if she is on anti -coagulant, uh, coagulation therapy or not? And also, she is a mental, mentally handicapped patient, so should be any um, any part of uh, combining with her, maybe any, some, somebody. Uh, uh, to take history from uh, with her, yeah. brought her to the hospital or she no, I mean, this is like a uh, handicap sexually act came and asking for contraceptive. So yeah, we need someone to ask us. Okay. Am I so right? Who will help you? The one who is caring for her. Yeah. Yeah. Then I will ask him uh, the age of menarche. Uh, what uh, is her uh, regular cycle or not, her the flow, um, and uh, if any bad surgical history, any allergy of uh, specific food or medication, the, um, uh, any other chronic medical illness other than the epilepsy, how frequent she is getting any seizure attack, is she following a regular uh, follow-up with the hematologist and the neuro a neuro a neurologist uh, about her compliance to treatment, any. This is, I think, all for history. Any allergies to specific food or medication? Okay. Uh, then uh, I will go for the examination, uh, okay. starting with general work. Uh, and, uh, and uh, the general work and uh, the neurological assessment, uh, vital signs, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, uh, uh, the feature of Down syndrome, of course, we should mention. Uh, then uh, the, um, I forget to ask about the cardiac, uh, with the Down syndrome, if there is any cardiac defect, like uh, cardiac element. Uh, no, no, that then, defect. Uh, yeah. Only with the car? Only she had transient ischemic attack. She's epileptic. She just one episode, but her cardiac health is fine. Yeah. Okay. So then I will do the uh, chest respiratory, including breast and uh, CVS uh, abdomen, uh, pelvic examination. Um, um, do you want me to mention the examination exactly, or I can go through it only? No, no, no. You can say you can say the examination that she is oh. fine. She's so the examination will go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll, yeah, the examination. I will do the pelvic examination, looking for any uh, skin abnormalities. Then by a uh, speculum examination, uh, checking the vagina, cervix, any uh, uh, discharges. I will take high vaginal swab. Then I will do by manual examination, checking uterine size, any adenoxial masses, if or uh, any tenderness. Then I will do per rectal examination, then lower limb examination. 
Then I will request for the patient investigation. She is an anti-coagulant, so we'll do CBC, uh, platelets, BT, BTT, maybe fibrin gene level, LFT, uh, RFT. I will check the anti-epileptic medication level. Uh, then uh, I will do for her, uh, uh, then I will start counseling her that she has a uh, thromboembolism, so the estrogen is contraindicated for her uh, condition. Okay. Um, but I am wondering, Doctor, if she is any handicap and mentally, and why she went. Uh, so yeah. shall I talk to her or her parents? Yeah. The guardian so, will also be with the, you know, in Down syndrome. Why this Down syndrome has been given here? Because they can have some understanding. Yeah, this is what I'm wondering. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you so know, even with the Down syndrome, someone... yeah, the patients will tell you that uh, I am. It is, it is, it happens all the time because their mental retardation is like this that they cannot uh, read many things. But when the matters of life they are being discussed, they understand them, and they will not be able to tell you exactly that what they feel. But many patients that if you will go to the description in the books, they will tell you that I like it. I like to have this sex because I feel happy. I feel better. I enjoy that. That is the reason. Or she's younger than 16. That that's why you know it's a complicated situation. You will see that what is the level yeah. of mental capacity of this patient and who is caring for her and can uh, and then you would involve her mother also in that discussion while in the other cases we are not involving the parents or anyone but she is downs and she is 14 underage and younger and maybe she is married we don't know about her no information has been given and this is an actual exam station actually yeah, that's why because it was in first time to have like this yeah. So we will yes, inform yeah. the mother and maybe we can yeah, yeah. involve her in the decision. Her own. Uh, uh, yeah, decision, uh, decision you will make according to the welfare of this girl, okay? And you are involving the parent only to take the history. The mother will tell you, mostly in this cases, in such cases, the mother will tell you, please remove her uterus. But then you have to tell her that she is 14. She has to live a long life because even with Downs, she is going to live into her 50s. If we will remove the ovaries from where she will get the hormones, okay? And she will have like surgical menopause. She will have bone issues. Her cardiac health will be compromised. But we can give her several methods of contraception where this, this, such problems can be controlled. And you don't know that she is married, she is unmarried or what. So that's why you need to involve yeah, I her. Didn't ask about yeah, so I should involve in the history if she's married or not. And then I will uh, tell her that the estrogen is contraindicated. So we can um, go with either um, the only the progesterone methods or the IUCD and hormonal uh, yes. copper IUCD. Yeah. And I will include all the risk and for both uh, methods and for how long it will be there because the, we should make sure if the the bills maybe she will not take it daily so there's an uh, implant or by injection. Yeah. Can you give her migraine? Can you give her migraine? Can you give her liver or gestural device? Because you know this station, it, it this station can be tested in many ways. Like she's coming to you for contraception, yeah. they, then they can give you another girl. Like she has, she's epileptic, and her mother says that her the periods of this girl has become very heavy, and it is very hard since she's growing big now. So it is very hard for the mother to care for her care for her child, so she wants you to give some proper form of treatment. She has come to you that remove the home because uh, because it is very hard to deal with her periods because they are very heavy and she has pains and she cries a lot during periods. So the theme is going yeah, to be I... the same. The mother will say, remove the uterus. Okay? And you will have to counsel them that removing the uterus is not going to solve the issue. It is going to increase the problems. Yeah, Why? Because it will make 
yeah, yeah. increase the risk also for thromboembolism and osteoporosis and it will cause um, high risk of uh, breast cancer and um, yani many no i mean that is the breast cancer is the hormonal sorry only it will the estrogen will yani osteoporosis and uh, as yeah, disease, it's uh, osteoporosis. Risk of having uh, cardiac disease will also increase. Yeah. yeah. So that's all. I will. This is what I, this is coming in my mind. No problem. Because this is atypical station, but you should be ready. They can always ask you something. So you should under. Uh, you should see here is an underage girl who is sexually active, or she wants to start in a sexual activity. Then she is epileptic and she has past history of transient ischemic attack. We don't know this, what was the cause of transient ischemic, transient ischemic attack. So we are going to take history. We will say that I will introduce myself. I will adopt a sensitive approach and I will like uh, ensure this patient about her confidentiality. And I will ask her that has she already started this sexual activity? Is she seeing somebody? Maybe because you know you have to exclude abuse also. Then. Are they using any barrier method? And are there any STI screening has been done? Has she received HPV vaccine? Because we cannot screen her because she's only 14. So we can only ask about the primary prevention. And then if she's seeing someone, what is the age of that one? Why? Because you know, if there is um, an age difference of more than five years, then in this, in this scenario, you will have to involve child protective protection issues. They will come up. When was her LMP and will she need emergency contraception or not? Like if she has already started or she was abused, she should tell you. So our parents, they should give you this information. And then if the girl is talking to you, you will say that I would like to ensure that she has informed her parents that something bad has happened to her because we don't know in this scenario what exactly is the case. Then second task for you is you will assess that how much mental capacity she has. Like uh, you will ask the mother that can she take, you will not tell the mother that she is sexually active, but you will tell, ask her that uh, does she remember to take her pills because she is epileptic. So it means that she is taking them every day. That is one thing. Okay. Then you need to test her capacity that she will be able to understand, retain the given info and then answer back uh, after making some mental decision like that. And can she will be able to communicate that what exactly she needs? Then the other issues are that what type of epilepsy she has, okay? What type of drugs she is taking? And are these enzyme inducers? Is she on lamotrigine? Because in cases of lamotrigine, you will have to increase the dose of the estrogen, estrogen into the COCPs. What is the degree of handicap? Like she can go to the school or she is going to the special school or she is staying at home. And the Mental Capacity Act says that capacity must be assumed unless it has been established that patient lacks the um, mental capacity. So how you can determine that? By asking simple questions. So this one, if she had some ischemic attack, so it means that we, that was you know the ischemic attacks because there was something which acted on the blood vessels. So we cannot give her combined contraception because it is harmful for her because the patient had a transient stroke like that. Does she have any other medical conditions that may be behind TIE? Maybe she is having some thrombophilia. Maybe she is having SLE. Maybe some blood vessels are thickened. Maybe she has IDDM. So they, all the information they have given us that she is epileptic. That is the point. Other relevant information that you will ask the maybe the girl can answer or if she cannot answer you will ask the one who is caring for her but does she feel the pain is are her periods heavy does she feel any pain does she cry during the periods then what kind of support she has she is like living with a parent who is can helping her or she is kept in some social home that is also very important because children are abused in the social homes also then we need further history like we can take from her notes from her electronic files and we need to test her capacity and we need to see that she understands certain principles Fraser guidelines but basically you will not take the name of Fraser guidelines you will say that I will ensure that she is understanding everything and she be I know I will ask her that you, you would like to tell your parents that you are sexually active and then I will ask her that are you sure that you would like to continue having sex with someone to feel safe or you are having any problem so then you will say I will make decision that she should get this 
her moral control is any protection otherwise she can become pregnant and her condition is already compromised then you will say that uh, that if the patient is fine and she is oriented to the time and place then i will involve her mother also and i will in, uh, refuse her she will not decide for the patient i will obtain legal order okay if the girl is in a relationship or she is has gotten married to someone you are going to make the uh, help her in the decision making and you will say if she lacks capacity then i will obtain legal order and i will offer everything then you will say that combined hormonal contraceptions we cannot give because that is going to be mac4 progesterone only pills yes they can be started and they but they need and compliance so i will see that if the parents are from a supportive and they can give this drug to her because she will need help so if she lives in a different place then i will have to give her depomedroxy progesterone acetate that one that is um, you know that drug this net that is unsuitable because the patient has, has passed history of transient ischemic attack Implanon that is suitable because it doesn't need much memory, so it can be inserted there for three years. Injections we will not give because because of this TIA. Then the uh, Mirena it is suitable, especially if the patient has heavy menstrual bleeding or she has dysmenorrhea like that. So then, sorry one second. Then we can offer her IUCD. Why? Because it has to be inserted just once and it is going to be functional for five years okay so if she's not having like heavy troublesome periods then you have the option to give her iucd the main point here is that if they ask you something that you cannot understand or you are unable to answer you will comment on her condition and then you will say here i need consultant input that is important if you suspect abuse because they can give you any history in that case you will involve the forensic medicine people this conference will now be recorded. So this woman has come to you and she's very angry that why you gave contraception to you put next plan on for this 14 year old girl. So what will you like, how you will deal with her? First, I will introduce myself. That's I'm Dr. Okay. Susan, uh, uh, covering the OB-GYN clinic. So I will okay. ask uh, how can I help her. And then the mother will ask me about. So she's angry that why you gave this pill to my young daughter. You should not have done that. So what would you like to tell her? You say that your daughter, uh, I will not tell you anything about her. She has the right to information. She was seen by two doctors. We evaluated her condition and we reached this decision that it is important to give her contraception. That is the thing. So actually this part, it can come as a part of a station like that. So you should be ready for it. So you will so, just go introduce yourself. Then you may say that um you should not say nice to see you because she's here to fight with you so you will say that i will pay attention i will uh, greet her in the usual way i will introduce myself and i will watch for her body language and you should not say that um i will just tell her and uh, do this you will say that i will just confirm that she has come to me so i will ask her that what she is looking for how i can how i could help her so she will come and let her talk uninterrupted okay so she will keep saying many things, many things. They will say that this woman is yelling at you. So what she will do? She will say, I will not interrupt her. I will listen to her side of the story and I will try to understand that why she is upset, what is her main concern. So then she will say that I will try to diffuse her anger. I will say that I'm really sorry. I'm sorry, I understand your concerns as a caring mother, but I also have a duty of confidentiality towards my patients whether or not your daughter was one of them, so I cannot talk to you about her in specific. And uh, the thing is that the woman will come that, no, no, tell me, why are you not telling me? Why are you hiding from me? You are a bad doctor. I will take you to the court. 
so you should say again i understand that um, you are showing that i understand that you are concerned here and you will say mrs so and so i may not be able to remember your doctor but can you tell me about your concerns she will again say that you know you have given her contraception and now my daughter will go or maybe somebody will you um, uh, abuse her so what is your problem why have you given it to her we will not even realize and she will have some issues how come you how you could do such a horrible thing you will say mrs so and so i am unable to talk about your daughter in specific but if you let me i can explain that you that how things are done in the hospital like that and the things um, the way we are doing things in this hospital they are just like the same as you will do in uk usa or ksa we are following standard practice so in cases where the young girls they will request anything so we will have to do the we will have to decide on the merit i um I've, i check that how much your she is and then i can just uh, i will you do the best for my parents like that she will say that you have given her and this will happen what will happen so you will say that i understand your concerns but i'm not going to break the confidentiality of my patient and uh, i have done the best thing in her possible if for her help so um, mrs so and so you don't have to agree with me but the point is that she can have many complications and uh, we at our level have done our best the, the best we could have done for her and the point is that she should not be becoming pregnant at this young age because she has multiple problems so we have made the best decision for her what have we done and what we have not done uh, we are not going to tell you and then you can say that if such girls in the young age they become pregnant they have many challenges and which i which can occur to your doctor also like that so do you have any other questions because i'm not going to give you any information on my patient so they can also give you like this teacher they can ask you someone that the husband has come and he is very angry he said that his wife is pregnant and while uh, if you will map back the duration of pregnancy then at the time of conception he was not even in the country like that so there also you will not break the confidentiality you will just say that what we have seen we have mentioned and without the permission from the patient i cannot give you any confirmation sometimes in the scenario they can give you a husband who has come and he is asking that my wife is not getting pregnant so uh, we were before we were having one child every year and now since she came to you she is not producing any child and uh, then she is not producing any children so when i told tell her that i we need to go to the doctor she declined to do that also so have you given her something something like that so there also you are going to deal in the same way because i understand that in the system what we are doing we are taking consent of the husband also for doing this btl sterilization but in the kingdom also if you will go to the laws that is wrong we should not be asking you we should not be giving um, asking the husband the patient is your primary patient so we need to ask the patient only so at least for the exam you will say the same thing so when if if they will ask you about the consent and the implications then they will bring two three small restrictions and then they will ask you that how you are going to deal with her that is important like okay and then you will say that if you want more information then next time you can bring your daughter with you and if your daughter will allow then we can have a combined meeting and joint meeting and outside that i will not comment on anything they will force you they will say many things but your answer will be the same that no i will not comment on what i have done and i will not break patient's confidentiality that's all you need to do okay that is it this Sorry. conference will now be yeah. recorded you can start oh, no no this is maybe okay. you will like to listen to it later that's the reason okay yeah okay uh, so uh, first of all, I will introduce myself to the patient. Um, I will ask her. I will check if she is oriented. Uh, I will ask her about her name, age. Uh, that she had she got any uh, pregnancy before or not? Is she single or married? Um, mm -hmm. I will ask about uh, and is she's on a continuous contraception or not? Um, currently on contraception or not? I will ask her about um, uh, the incidence of the sexual assault. 
uh, when uh, the date and timing exactly of the assault and um, I will ask about um, uh, how the situation happened, uh, any, um, any penetration, uh, either uh, vaginal, anal or oral. Um, I will ask her about um, uh, any injuries, um, any head injuries, or traumas to anywhere of her body. Um, I will ask her uh, if she is um, if she is up to her uh, up to date with her vaccines. Does she had vaccine or not? She had history before of STIs or not? Um, uh, any medical problem? Any surgical problem? Any um, um, during the assault uh, was she oriented or she was on um, was she under alcohol effect uh, or uh, substance abuse and uh, what one which one exactly? Um, I would ask her about uh, smoking history, uh, if she um, if she is a smoker or not, uh, and I will ask her uh, when last time she had tetanus vaccine. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, that's it. Then I will proceed with examining the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. General look, uh, vital signs, um, uh, any uh, any body trauma. Uh, general examination, head, uh, head, the neck, uh, head, uh, neck, and teeth, uh, chest examination, um, uh, respiratory, abdominal uh, palpation, and percussion. And I will check for any injuries and will act based on each injury uh, by itself. Uh, I will uh, involve also in her care the, the general uh, ER, the emergency department uh, people. Uh, and uh, if she is under um, and uh, toxicology uh, substance abuse uh, toxicology should be taken from her um, I would um, I would examine her uh, with using a, a, a rib, um, a rib kit, a kit, mm -hmm. sorry rape um, yes. I will take sample from, uh, from the patient looking for any um, Hair, uh, semen um, uh, from from the from the assaulter, uh, and uh, would uh, will um, will make sure that she. Um, um, uh, this would I would ask her if she before. Uh, sorry, one 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 question I forgot to ask in the history. What happened after the assault? Was she able to wash her body? Uh, is she is still? Um, did she wash her body or not? Uh, did she clean herself? Did she wash her teeth or not? Uh, in order before uh, taking the sample to make sure that there is a DNA from from the from the person who raped her. Um, uh, then uh, during examination, I will also do uh, after after using the rape to take the DNA of the of the DNA thing. Um, I will do for that a high vaginal swab. Um, yeah smear uh, of the patient if, if it is not available in the and she is at the age of uh, after above the age of 21 years but this patient is only 16 years but if she's 21 and above I will take it um, I will uh, I will I, I will check all her body for any bruises any fractures um, any injury yeah so yeah okay how uh, what medical care should be given to this person now okay uh, the medical care for this patient uh, it has multiple uh, aspects uh, one of them is uh, is uh, giving the patient emergency contraception mm -hmm. uh, second aspect is uh, to uh, make sure that the patient is uh, covered against STIs mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, and uh, also investigate against um, STIs and others and uh, vaccine. So regarding the regarding the the medication that she should receive, she should receive uh, medication against chlamydia, gonorrhea, and uh, trichomonas. So she should receive uh, metronidazole oral once and uh, cytrexime oral once and uh, doxycycline or azithromycin oral uh, either azithromycin once uh, do one dose or uh, for seven days uh, she should receive also a hepatitis vaccine uh, and uh, tetanus vaccine uh, patient uh, should uh, be uh, screened against uh, sti by high vaginal uh, against herpes hiv hepatitis b uh, and yes, telling me the uh, by swapping. Yeah, and when she should yeah. return for pregnancy, there's something. Yeah. 
uh, after that, uh, the patient should uh, should be seen by uh, psychotherapy. Um, I would offer her that she should see. Um, uh, we should refer her uh, from now uh, for uh, psycho for social uh, workers and uh, psychology because in the next three months it is the highest um, is the highest timing for her to uh, to have uh, sexual impact, sorry, um, psychological impact, impact from the from the rape. Um, also, I would I should see her in one week. Uh, time and uh, uh, we will check if uh, if no pregnancy that's fine. Uh, also, I forgot to ask about the pregnancy. Just uh, the first thing should be done before starting anything in uh, in her management. Um, and also, um, uh, and she should be seen after one week. Uh, mm -hmm. And after that, we could confirm that she's pregnant or not. If uh, if her if her period delayed by uh, by ten days. Then she should have also again a pregnancy test. Yes, that is the point. So well done because you know they can ask you many things. The important point is to remember that any patient who is coming to you with a fear of assault, if she's not mentioning, but she's she will um, act as if she has she's like in a stress and she's not reporting. So then what you will do? You will say that my first action will be in the presence of chaperone can be nurse, can be anyone, we will try to stabilize the patient. This is the first step to determine that what are the vital signs and take uh, whatever is required to stabilize the patient. Informed consent, once she's stable, then I will take informed consent and then I will take history. I will re reassure her that we are going to maintain her confidentiality. She should not fear about it. And we are going to record the events that what happened in what sequence and we will write everything in the patient's own word and we will also obtain a reproductive obstetric sexual and contraceptive history before starting for the emergency contraception you should know is she taking anything in the routine or not then i will carry out examination with her consent we will offer general physical examination abdominal examination and then we will have to do the pelvic examination and we have to take her permission. And uh, uh, if we have this forensic department, uh, we will try to arrange him because he will be able to take the samples in a better way. If not available, then we are going to make pictures. And if the patient, uh, and then we are going to keep a photographic record only if the patient will permit. Otherwise, uh, we will just simply take the samples and we will keep her. If there, we will encourage her that she should involve police. But if she is not interested in informing the police, then we will still take the samples and tell her that these are your property we are keeping in the hospital. They will be safe and sound labeled with your name. And uh, like we are using the rape kit and maybe later you will like to report them. And so when you are making drawings, you, if there are any injuries, if there are any abrasions, you are keeping the record. And then you will take the spe specimen. Rape kit should be used to obtain biologic specimen, for example, vaginal, oral, or anal specimen for DNA or other evidence of you for use in the potential legal proceedings. So they must be appropriately labeled, documented, including signatures of the receiving authorities. Also, we will obtain baseline tests for BDRL, HIV screening, pregnancy test, and urine drug screen, and also blood alcohol levels. The profile axis we need to give, they will be an antibiotic profile axis. It should be administered for gonorrhea, like ceftriazone can be given to 50 milligrams intramuscular once. For chlamydia, I will give her azithromycin one gram orally. And for the, the trichomoniasis, we are going to give her 500 and two grams metronidazole, not 500, because if you will give 500, you will have to give for seven days, so you will give two grams orally once. Then we need to give post exposure profile access for HIV infection that will be in the form of a reality grammar. So it should be started within 24 hours like that. And um, everything should be given before we should start before uh, 36 hours because if 36 hours have passed, then this uh, heart therapy is not going to be very effective uh, because you know, the virus has already entered the system. Active and passive immunization, you know, both immunoglobulin and the vaccine you have to give for hepatitis b after that you will say that patient i will give her emergency contraception we can give her high dose progesterone or we can give her ulipristal acetate so it should be given at this time and then uh, what we will do that we will offer her this post vital profile access for pregnancy that is the thing 
and then we will document everything and we, if we have like access we are going to arrange for the person and there's like the, the forensic expert should see her we will arrange a follow-up appointment for this from this patient after after three weeks and in the after three weeks we are going to check that what are the um, content uh, that she is not pregnant and then uh, like you said that we need to put her in touch with the forensic people uh, with the psychiatrist also uh, and social worker also because such people they are under tremendous stress and it won't be a good idea to let them go like this because the incidence of suicide and PTSD is very high after such cases. So rehabilitation of the patient is equally important. So that's all you need to remember. Here are some stations on gonorrhea, on chlamydia, and also you should remember and other important thing like um, um, you know the, these complications um, like PID. 